Are you afraid of death? Let's start with an easy question. <laughs> There's no warm up. That's it. We're, we're no straight warm up. No jumping jacks. <laughs> let's uh, let's break that down into two questions. Um, I'm a human being, and like any human being, I'm biologically programmed to be terrified of death. Every physical element in our bodies is designed to keep us away from death. Um, I'm no different from anyone else in that regard. If you throw me from the top of the Empire State Building, I'm going to scream all the way down to the concrete. Um, if you wave a loaded firearm in my face, I'm going to flinch away in horror the same way anyone else would. Um, so in that first sense of, are you afraid of death? Uh, my, my body is terrified of injury leading to death the same way any, any other human being would. So when death is imminent, there's a terror that yeah, will cause I, I go through the same the adrenaline body. dumps that you would go through. Yeah. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you're also asking a much deeper question, which is presumably, are you afraid of non-existence? What yeah. comes after your physical death? And that's the more interesting question. Um, no, uh, I should start right uh, by, by, by saying from, from the start, uh, I'm a materialist. I, I don't believe that we have an immortal soul. I don't believe there's a life after our physical death. Um, in this sense, from someone who starts from that point of view, you have to understand that everyone has two deaths. We always talk about our death as though there was only one, but we all have two deaths. There was a time before you were born when you were dead. You weren't afraid of that period of non-existence. You don't even think about it. So why would you be afraid of your second period of non-existence? You came from non-existence. You're going to go back into it. You weren't afraid of the first. Why are you somehow afraid of the second? So it doesn't really make sense to me as to why people would be afraid of, of non-existence. You dealt with it fine the first time. Um, deal with it the second time. But your mind didn't exist for the first death. And it won't exist after you die either. But it does exist now enough to comprehend that there's this thing that you know nothing about that's coming, which is non-existent. Actually, you do know about it because you know what it was like before you were born. It was just nothing. Like you, every, every, every time you go to sleep at night, you get a sneak preview of death. It's just this kind of nothing happens. You wake up in the morning, you're, you're alive again. But it's not about the sleeping, it's about the falling asleep. And every night when you fall asleep, you assume you're going to wake up. Here you know you're not waking up. And the knowledge of but that- But there's a whole step from that to the idea of fearing it. I'm fully aware that there's gonna be a time I don't wake up, but are you gonna be afraid of it? Is there some mortal terror you have of this? No, you didn't have it before. You don't have it when you sleep. Um, going from the fact that you know you won't wake up to terror is, Two different things that's an extra step and at that point you're, you're making a choice at that uh, at that point what about what some people in our in this context we might call like the third death which is when um, everybody forgets the entirety of consciousness in the universe forgets that you've ever existed that john donaher ever existed so it's so, almost like a cosmic death it's like everything goes yeah not not just I, I would say it's like knowledge. The history books forget mm -hmm. about who you are because the history books. This is inevitable, by the way. We're all very, very small players in a very big game. And inevitably, we're all going to go at some point. Yeah, but doesn't. So you're. It's, it's disappointing, of course. Like it, it's, um, <laughs> but, but it's not even. It, it would be arrogance to say um, I'm disappointed in the idea that I will disappear. But there's, there's far greater things than me that will disappear. I mean, it, it, it's crushing to think that there's going to come a time where no one will ever hear Beethoven's symphonies again, that the, the mysteries of the pharaohs will be lost and no one will even comprehend that they once existed. Like, Humanity has come up with so many amazing things over its existence. And to think that one day this is just all happening on a tiny speck in a distant corner of a very small uh, galaxy and among millions of galaxies, that this is all for nothing. Okay, I can understand. There's a kind of dread that comes with this. Um, 
but there's also a sense in which the moment you're born and the moment you can think about these things, you know this is your inevitable fate. Is it so inevitable? So if we look at, uh, we're in Austin and there's a guy named Elon Musk and he's hoping, in fact, that is the drive behind many of his passions is the human beings becoming multiplanetary species and expanding out, exploring and colonizing the solar system, the galaxy, and maybe the rest of the universe. Is that something that fills you with excitement? Uh, it's As a project, it's very exciting. I. Um, uh, the whole idea, I mean, we all grew up with science fiction, the idea of, uh, of exploration, the same way uh, human beings in earlier centuries were thrilled at the idea of discovering a new world, you know, America or some other part of the world that they sail to and come back. But now instead of sailing oceans, you're, you're sailing solar systems and uh, ultimately even further. Um, so, of course, that's exciting. But as far as relieving us from non-existence, it's just playing a, a delaying game because ultimately even the universe itself, if the laws of thermodynamics are correct, will ultimately die. Of course, we might not understand most of uh, the physics and how the universe functions. You said laws of thermodynamics, but maybe that's just a tiny little fraction of what the universe actually is. Maybe there's multiple dimensions. Maybe, maybe there's multiple universes. Maybe the entirety of this experience. You know, there's guys like Donald Hoffman that think that all of this is just an illusion that we don't like. Human cognition and perception constructs a whole. It's like a video game that we construct that's very distant from the actual reality. And maybe one day we'll understand that reality. Maybe it'll be like the Matrix kind of thing. So there, there's a lot of different possibilities here. And there's also a philosopher named Ernest Becker, I don't know if you know who that is, he wrote uh, Denial of Death, and his idea, he disagrees with you, but he's dead now, uh, <laughs> is, is that he thinks that the terror of death, the terror of the knowledge that we're going to die is within all of us and is in fact the driver behind most of the creativity that we do. Exploring out into the universe, but also you becoming one of the great scholars of the martial arts, the philosophers of fighting, is because you're actually terrified of death, and you want you want to somehow permeate like your knowledge, your ideas, your essence to permeate human civilization, so that even when your body dies, you live on. Mm. I would agree with him insofar as uh, death is the single greatest motivator for action. But going beyond that and saying that it's somehow terrifying, that's that's an extra step on his part. Um, and not everyone's going to follow him on that step. I do believe that death is the single most important element in life that gives value to our days. If you think, for example, of a situation where a god came to you and gave you immortality. Life would be very, very different for you. Uh, you're a, a talented uh, research scientist. Um, you work to a schedule. Why? Because ultimately you know your life is finite and actually very finite. And could be even more so if, if fate plays its hand and you uh, uh, die an early death or what have you. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, as such, we get work done uh, as soon as we can. The moment you gain immortality, you can always put every project off. You can always say, I don't need to do this today because I can do it four centuries from now. Mm -hmm. And as you extend artificially a human life, the motivation to get things done here and now and work industriously and, and excel fades away because you can always come back to the idea that you can do this in the future. And so what gives value to our days is ultimately death. And value, it's not the only form of, uh, the only reason behind value, but a huge part of what we consider value is scarcity. And death gives us scarcity of days and is probably the single greatest motivator for almost every action we partake in. It's kind of tragic and beautiful that what what makes things amazing is that they end. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it would actually be a terrible burden to be immortal. You would, um, life would be in many ways very hollow and meaningless, I think. People talk about death taking away the meaning of life, but I think immortality would have a very similar effect in a different direction.